got to talk about, since I'm getting there, we got to talk about the, uh, I'm not going to talk about anything. So we have to talk about the Copenhagen interpretation and the uncertainty principle. So this is a picture of Werner Heisenberg giving a lecture. Much as I am giving a lecture, he said he is wearing a tie. <laughs> Werner is also using a blackboard, which is a much better way to give a lecture, actually. And, uh, uh, but uh, we don't do that anymore. And uh, it, so a wave of particle, which is it? Interpretation both and neither. So this is a. This is kind of a getting into serious logical problems. This is why philosophers love this stuff. They get hold of it, they'll crunch, they'll turn out things, it'll all be nonsense. Be careful. There are some philosophers who study this very hard and they understand what they're doing, but there are also a lot of, like, uh, mm, I don't know, theorists in various fields, sociology or something else. So it's just like the uncertainty principle. This is very popular. They say, this is just like the uncertainty principle, which adds nothing. <laughs> so electrons and atoms follow wave dynamics. Okay, but they appear in experiments as particles. So each of these classical concepts, these are classical concepts. These are concepts based on our experience at our scale, with baseball bats, with stars even, with, uh, with railroad trains, the things they had, you know. Each of these classical concepts is inadequate by itself, and you need both of them together. And one thing that you can't dodge which is a consequence of the wave nature, is the uncertainty principle. So if you think about what you do with those inclined planes and projectile motion problems and the Atlas machine that I made fun of at the beginning, I shouldn't have made fun of that. That stuff is dead serious. That was the most important questions that were holding up how people could understand the universe for thousands of years. Okay, that stuff is dead serious. Don't think it's a joke. It's not a joke. It's not a toy. I know it seems simple. I know it seems obvious. It's not obvious. But they, they, they do studies today. To this day, they do studies where people are, uh, are they ask people if they walk along and they drop, uh, you know, their coke, where does it land? And everybody, including people who have taken physics exhaustively, including physics majors, this is the thing scares me, says that it lands behind them. Okay? They all say that. It's not what happens. The, uh, the, the, the stuff keeps going. It has a definite momentum. It has a definite position. We can measure the position and the function of the momentum. We can tell where all the particles move. We can choreograph the entire dance of the universe down to the last gnat's eyelash. Okay? This is classical mechanics. It's very beautiful. It, 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 so I wrote in one sentence, in old mechanics, a particle has definite momentum P and definite position X. And you can do whatever you want with it. And you can have a fully causal universe in which one thing causes the next thing causes the next thing, and the universe evolves completely all by itself. In wave nature, we have this problem that we don't have definite momentum and position at the same time anymore. And I'll show you a little bit why that is in a second. But the shorthand for this is written in this inequality here, which is very famous, which means that uncertainty in the momentum, how well you know the momentum, or how well you can tell the momentum in an experiment, times how well you can tell the position in an experiment, cannot be less than a certain number, which is related to the Planck's constant. This is, a, again, was a bit of an ansatz when it was first laid down by Heisenberg. But once people understood the relationship between wave and particle nature, uh, it becomes very clear. Now I have to get a little technical for a minute here to explain something about why it's clear. So please bear with me. Be aware that I'm not expecting you to carry away all of you know, what you learned in the physics major course from this one lecture. But let's talk about it just for a minute anyway. So a wave looks like those nice certain, those nice things I drew, but they don't, right? Things in real life are not all sines and cosines and pretty and, and, and stuff. They have sharp edges, they have kinks, they have corners. They come, they're not periodic, they just appear, blip, you know, that's it, one of them, and so on. It turns out you can make any shape whatsoever, any shape, by adding enough different waves together. If you add, 
So a complicated wave is made of many components. Here's a wave, a thing that goes ink, 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 ink. It's <laughs> and look what happens. Here's the first, here's a sine wave that has the same frequency as that thing. And it doesn't do a good job of reproducing the shape of this thing at all. It doesn't look like it at all. So we add a, another one that has a higher frequency to it, and another one that has a higher frequency than that. And as we add more and more components, you see that we can kind of smooth out the edges and eventually get to something that looks like this uh, That looks like this thing. It turns out to make something with sharp edges like this, you need an infinite number of these components. You have to add up all a bunch of different frequencies, all of which are related to each other. They're called harmonics. So if you, if you play a string instrument of any kind, you know about harmonics. You know that you get, you know you get the, the basic sound that comes out and a higher sound that goes with it. The pianos do this too. That's why they have a rich tone. Uh, if, you want a pe if you want a way to describe a particle at one spot, it has to be especially complicated. All right? It, it, because it, it's not periodic anymore. And you can see this happening by adding up, forget the title for a moment, and just look at the picture. So here's something that looks a little bit like that previous picture I showed you, and many wavelengths contribute, okay? If you want to spread these out and have it up a little bit and then down most of the time, and up a little bit and then down most of the time, you have to add many more wavelengths together. Many, many more wavelengths together. If you want to go farther, farther apart, you've got to add many, 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 many more wavelengths together. And in the limiting case, which is just in our imagination, in the limiting case in our imagination, where this goes out here to infinity on that side, and this goes out here to infinity on that side, and we're left with just a singular disturbance in space and time. Okay, you have to add an infinite number of wavelengths together. And they have to be infinitely close together as well. So this has all wavelengths in it with some relative contributions. <coughs> so does that make sense to people? that you have to add these different wavelengths together to get arbitrary shapes. I can't prove that. It's a, it's a true fact. It was invented by Mr. Fourier, Monsieur Fourier, in the, uh, in, the, in the 1800s. It's one of the great, beautiful facts of mathematical physics, okay? Uh, it, it, it turns out that you have to have infinite numbers of them to get this spot here. Now, that constitutes a bit of a problem because we said that the frequency, also known as the wavelength of the wave, determines its momentum as a particle. So that means that we now know where this thing is exactly. We made a, a we constructed a kind of wave assemblage. It's called a wave packet. To, uh, uh, by construction, we put it together so we know where the thing is exactly. But it's got all these different wavelengths. In it. You have no idea what its momentum is. Zero, none. You can't tell what the momentum of that thing is anymore. That satisfies the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle shows you that, uh, somebody asked for the math part, this is the math part, I suppose. The, uh, the uncertainty principle shows you that, in fact, you, uh, you, you, once you know exactly where it is, if it's a wave, you know nothing about its momentum. Uh, conversely, if you have a regular wave, just one wave, a little sine wave going up and down like that, that has no beginning and no end and you have no idea where the particle is. So you know its momentum exactly. You have a plain wave, but you don't know where it is. So this is a, so the wave nature is complementary to the particle nature. This is a picture I took out of the, out of a book, I scanned out of a book, sorry. It didn't come out so great. But here's a localized wave. Here, here's, a, here's a plain wave, okay? And here's its, a, here's its frequency. You know its frequency exactly, but you know nothing about it. Position. Here's something where you know its position pretty well. We add a whole bunch of stuff together and you have a delta x here, which tells you roughly speaking where the thing is, where, the, where there is wave, is where the thing is, where there is wave function, okay, where there is atomic orbital, to go to the case of talking about atoms. You know where it is, you know, but you don't, you had to add a whole bunch of different frequencies here. So this plot is how much frequency you've got for each frequency as a function of frequency. And you can see there's a spread there now. You don't know its momentum anymore. So delta x decreases means delta wavelength increases, means delta p increases from p is h over lambda, which was the Bloyd's equation that we used earlier to talk about the wave nature of the electron. So the uncertainty principle 
tells us that you could either tell the position or the momentum. There are many uncertain principles. There are many pairs of things that, that, that particles do that have this uh, that have this feature. Energy and time are another one, another one. There are components of the spin that we'll, we'll talk about polarization in a minute that have this feature. That there are there are pairs of things that cannot be studied at the same time. And they have to do with different ways of representing particles mathematically, which brings me back to my favorite thing, polarization. Okay. This is our classical polarization feature. Anybody remember this? It was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> it feels like it feels like six weeks ago. Yeah. The, uh, so here we had polarization, which was this way or this way, except that we could also make it, it was this way or this way, except we could also make it this way or this way. They're both equally good descriptions. They're two different descriptions of the same thing. So the question was, does the description still work at the scale of the very small atoms in very weak ways? So we'll go back the light polarization with our new Copenhagen interpretation. Now, the purple node is important. A radio station that we talked about before has about 10 to the 11th photons per square, per cubic centimeter, I should have said, at, uh, at 25 mile radius, okay? That's a typical big radio station. That's a heck of a lot of photons. It's no wonder it's a classical description. You're doing a statistical average over the behavior of a very large number of particles. Uh, now we're going to look one by one at these things and see can we say something about each particle individually. So let's talk about, instead of talking about electric fields, let's just say X polarization is one condition that a photon can be in and Y polarization is another condition that a photon can be in. And we label those by these funny symbols. These were invented by Dirac, but I, for now I just want you to think of them as the two states. The state X and the state Y. It turns out, because of the wave nature, remember I talked about how waves could be added together? Remember how, how we, we saw that the combination of waves from the two slits was the thing that caused to have, uh, to have this, the, the specifically quantum type behavior? At a deeper mathematical level, that means that states can be added together still form a good state. So a general state for your photon is some bit of the x state and some bit of the y state. As a matter of fact, if we add them in equal amounts to, together with one another, we get the 45 degree state that we talked about before. Conversely, the 45 degree state could be here. I, I could have 45 degrees and minus 45, 135 degrees here, and add those together to get a state which was x or y. Both descriptions are perfectly valid, okay? And it, until you do an experiment, you don't have any reason to prefer one to the other. They're valid descriptions of the, uh, of, of, the, of the particle. And we now interpret our polarization thing differently. We say that this wave function coming along here. This was the beginning, the first one. This corresponds to this here. Okay. That the, uh, is a combination, and when it hits a Y polarizing filter, it makes a decision. We say, roughly, very roughly, something random happens, and some of the, 50% of the time, this part of the thing I'm sorry, this part of the thing vanishes, and then this, which is 50%, goes through, and 50% of the time it's this one and it gets absorbed. So at the place where you put the measuring instrument, something happens to the electron wave function. That's what we talked about with the slits, right? That, you would, that, that by interacting with it, you might, uh, it, it would cause it to make a decision. The wave that's going out there in a two-slit experiment is 50% left hole, 50% right hole. You put something that makes that, that is a filter that tells you which one is going through, and it'll make a decision which one it goes through. And you lose 
the y component, the x component forever after that, unless you put a 45 degree one, which now can result, can put it back. That's why I call it a regenerator. This is really important slide. So I want people to think about this for like 30 seconds. Because what we've got here is the basic principle of quantum mechanics, which is <coughs> particles are described by states. States can be added to one another. You could have a set of states that tells you everything that can happen. Now, X and Y are complete. You can describe any combination, any angle using X and Y. So it's just like I and J vectors. You can make any vector out of, out of I and J. Okay. This is hard. I, I don't want people to think this is, this is trivial. It's not trivial. The more you think about it, the worse it gets. Because you can do things with those guys. So now I'm going to start talking about entanglement. Everybody's heard this word. What the heck are we talking about? Well, entanglement is something that occurs. Everything I talked about there was one by one by one by one. One electron, one photon. However, what happens when you got two of them? What happens when you got three of them? But we get some cool stuff in this. What happens when you get two of them is that the normal thing that is done is nothing complicated. The first, you, you make a product of the state of the first one and the state of the second one. However, that's simple enough, right? So, we, we, so now we have something that, this is, a two, this is a photon source. I'm sorry I used the gamma thing here. This should say photon source. And it lets out two, two photons simultaneously in such a way that they don't have any overall photon. That, that's just, you, you can measure that. You, it, it, it's a, at an atomic level, you can say that if this is polarized that way, the other one has to be polarized down. It, it can't have any overall polarization. So, so there's two observers that look at these things, Alice and Bob, always called Alice and Bob, A and B. And they, each of them has a polarizer, OK? Each of them has a polarizer. So the state that comes out is x times a, it, it, it is a in the x polarization and b in the y polarization. Or it's equally good to say that a is in the y polarization and b is in the x polarization. Either one of those is OK. We haven't looked at it. We don't know which one it is. They're both OK. So this is more than just a product because you can add this other combination and it's just as good. It's just, it's all I did was swap the two things. That's what we call entanglement. When you can make something that's just as good by swapping particles around, and then, then you have something that's entangled. It's not simple anymore. Uh, you know, if it's just this, then if Alice sets her thing so that she lets through A things and measures it to be X, Suppose, suppose she measured it to be x, OK? You know, Bob will immediately only see ones that go y, that are y. X, this thing is set up so that it gets out. It sends an x one side and a y the other side. I suppose that's not actually no overall polarization, so I'm afraid that's kind of an error. Please forgive me. What actually happens is it sends out x polarization one side and y polarization the other side. Uh, so. You know, if he knew what she saw, he would know how to set his filter so that he would see 100% of the photons go through it. The only way he can know, of course, is that she calls him with a telephone. You don't violate the speed of light here. What happens is, but it is a, nevertheless a fact that viewed from remotely far away where we are here in the classroom, that if, this, uh, if, if x goes through here, y must go through here, and conversely. So a measurement of Alice to be x means Bob will see y, and he knows immediately, well, the, the system knows immediately what Alice is seeing without, no matter, even if it violates the speed of light. I mean, if, if you do the experiment before 
a signal from here to get there, you'll find that it has to be Y. And this seems very surprising. It, fe it feels to people like it violates special relativity, for example. It feels like it's non-local. In other words, it, it is non-local. That's why it feels non-local. However, it does not violate special relativity because of the fact that Bob doesn't have the information about how Alice set her filter, so he doesn't know whether he's supposed to set it up or down or whatever unless she's calling him on the phone. Calling him on the phone can go at the speed of light, no more than that. And then, so, then he has information. Otherwise, he has no information. He's just got a thing. He doesn't know where to put it. If he puts it one way, he'll see 50% of the time. But he doesn't, still doesn't know how she set her thing. So you have to know how the, the, the choice that's made here has to be communicated to Bob, and that can only go on at the speed of light. If he wants to get 100% of the, of the correlation with what she wants. So that, it, this seems very surprising. The correlation here between these two is caused by the entanglement. And this seems very surprising. Moreover, in, in quantum mechanics, we can use the different descriptions equivalently. So I drew two pictures, same picture though, uh, so this time I did write photon source, but now this one is done with X and Y. This is exactly reproducing what was on the previous page. And this one is done with plus 45 and minus 45, which is just as good. They're, they're both equivalent. I mean, they, there's no difference in the dynamics here. The, the correlation will be the same, except that now Alice has chosen 45 degrees, means that if something goes through, it's guaranteed that only well, that, that it will not go through, guarantee that it will not go through if, uh, if, if, uh, if Bob chooses the same, and guarantee it will go through if Bob chooses the other. Guarantee, 100% of the time. Even though this is a thing that supposedly stops getting <coughs> photons. Okay. Does that make sense? 50% of the photons are stopped by this one. However, if it goes through, and he's got his thing set right, in either of these descriptions, 100% will go through. So that's not, that, that's odd. These things are communicating with each other, and so how it seems like, even though it's not in a way that can convey information to us faster than the speed of light. It gets worse. All right? It, because somebody, I mean, you know, sometimes I think theorists have too much time on their hands, basically. Because uh, they, uh, because Somebody said, well, what happens if, you know, Alice sets it this way and Bob sets it this way? Right? What happens then? Well, that's, a, that's interesting. So what happens if Alice and Bob use different base components or different base descriptions to do it? So Alice uses it up and, 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 and horizontal and Bob uses 45 degrees and minus 45 degrees, okay, uh, 135 degrees. What happens? Well, you lose this correlation. It turns out Alice sees the uh, sees a defined result, and Bob sees a statistical result. He sees half of those half of them go through, and half of them not go through. Which is, you know, you can build this up through individual things that seem like they make common sense, right? And then when you put the whole picture together, you get yourself into one of these waking up in the middle of the night screaming. Uh, depending, because now, depending on the choice of axis that Alice made, <coughs> either Bob sees 100% of the time something, or Bob sees a statistical result, depending on how he set this thing. So either this thing is completely one thing, or it's half and half of something else, or something. This drove Einstein nuts. This is a fundamental uncertainty of a, 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 of a of quantum mechanics, and nature is making choices here at the lowest level. I mean, it actually, it, it actually chooses to be x, but x, as I said before, not, which means Bob for sure has y, but y can be 45, half of this and half of this. So, what is going on? Is there a variable that tells you how much you've got each one of these in there somehow? Is there something attached to the photon that says I got this much 45 degree and this much? Uh, and this much 30 degree, and this much 20 degree, and this much vertical, and this much so on and so on. Those are the hidden variables, and there's mathematical proof that they can't exist. They get the wrong correlations. So you do experiments like this with correlations, and you'll find the wrong set of correlations. You add up the different, the different combinations, and that comes out wrong. And people were able to actually prove quantum mechanics. There was a period where there were 
doing dozens of experiments like this to try and prove quantum mechanics or not. And it always came out right. Except for one at the very beginning, which was a mess. Uh, okay, so it defines a very specific set of correlations. And at first glance, it looks like faster than light travel, but it isn't because Bob doesn't know what's going on on the other side. However, you can start messing around with travel. So I wanted to talk just for a few minutes about something I don't understand terribly well, but, but enough to give you an appreciation for some of the work that's going on. Quantum teleportation. Now, quantum teleportation is not quite like honest to gosh teleportation. It's not like you can throw an apple in there and it pops out on the other side. Yeah. It's like quantum tunneling. No, it's, it's different. Quantum tunneling is just simply the fact that if you have, you remember the particle in the box I drew? If the edges aren't, suppose the edges aren't infinitely high, okay? The, the wave can penetrate a little bit into the material, and if you have another hole on the other side, you can penetrate through sometimes. So what happens is you have something that's kind of a, that, that, that's periodic and then it becomes like a decaying function inside the thing and then it becomes periodic again. And again. So that, that, this is different than tunneling. Tunneling is a real phenomenon that happens all the time, but this is much stronger. I mean, that, that's straight enough. I mean, that was, a, that, was, that was up on the forefront of, a, of, of, of a, and still is in sort of a quantum, in sort of nanotechnology applications. But the, this is something that's a, even stranger. This is more in cryptography applications that they like this stuff. So real, and quantum computing, which is a huge field now. So in fact, there's a problem with quantum computing is that once you create a uh, quantum state, it's very hard to transmit the information about what that quantum state was to any place else without destroying it because of what we said. When you interact with the quantum state, it makes a choice. And the, comp and the, the whole idea of quantum computing is you have these so-called qubits, which are combina entangled combinations, carry more information than just one bit of information does, which is great. But if you can't copy them, they're like totally useless, right? What's the point of having a, co a computer that you can't copy the data? It's kind of useless. So, the, uh, so how to transport a quantum state is the question. There's something called the no cloning theorem, which show, which just shows that if you try and copy it, it's destroyed. All the, the correlations are destroyed and you don't have it anymore. So what do you do? Well, you want this quantum state to be reproduced in another place. Now it's not an apple, but it is something. It's an atom in a specific state or a set of photons in a specific set of polarizations. It's something. So it's not, and you know, maybe someday it's an apple, but it's certainly not now. So what they do, is they create a quantum state called psi. And Alice has to add another set of things. And EPR pairs stands for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, the first people who thought of the entanglement. And <laughs> Einstein did a lot of stuff. <laughs> and uh, if you add these together, I'm not going to go into the details because it's pages and pages of algebra. There's no way we could do it. But if you add these together and share the other half of the entangled pair with somebody far away, remember we, we did that? They were sharing the they're sharing the, the entangled pair between these two. Okay. If you do that, you share the half of the entangled pair and do and add these together and do a sort of two slit type experiment and look at the results. The results will tell you some numbers, okay? And those numbers, you can get on the telephone, two classical bits, they tell you some numbers. They don't actually tell you what the state was, interestingly enough, you can't know what the state is without destroying it. But they tell you some numbers. And they tell you numbers that you can then phone on the phone over to Bob, and Bob can set his stuff to do the inverse of this measurement it's all polarizers and half silvered mirrors and so on. It's quite complex. And he puts the EPR pair into that and he'll get psi back out on the other side. So you started out with this thing here. You ran it through a bunch
bunch of a sort of two slit type experiment or an, an in curve and uh, quantum interference experiments, you destroy this in the process. It's gone. It's not, it, it doesn't exist anymore, but it exists on this side. So by making this phone call here and conveying this extra information from this measurement to there, he was able to set his polarizers or whatever in such a way as to make the same thing emerge at the other end. That's really, honest to gosh, teleportation. You started out with a matter in a certain state, you ended up miles away in the same state without traveling. So actually, it's real. Uh, you use a third particle in the telephone, you can give instructions to allow the state to be recreated, I think I said that, and it destroys the original state. So it's just really just like real teleportation. Like you put the apple in and it disappeared, except it's on a very, very simple level. Somewhere. Can I ask a question? Sure. What if you're on a conference call with six other people with filters? If anybody, interesting thing about most quantum cryptography uh, applications is that if anybody listens in, it destroys the information or leaves an indelible mark that has been listened to. So people use this stuff for, for these kind of entangled pairs as a way to, to also give a, uh, code keys that can't really be broken because they're based on create, being created by quantum random effects at the time that the message is generated. If somebody listens, it changes the message in such a way that you can always tell. So you can always tell if somebody's listening to your message. So the conference calls really are not, not here in this. It may be that somebody, there's something called quantum repeaters, which I don't understand, which, which basically destroy the original state and just put out the same thing and they just kind of do the same thing at, at one spot. I really don't know how to do something with a multiple multiple actors involved. So here's a, something out of a, somebody's website. This happens to come from the University of Innsbruck. These people in Austria kind of did the thing first and best. And it's on the cutting edge of research. They have transported the information to do this recreation over 10 kilometers of optical fiber. That's pretty good. They made that's you know five miles away over the river. They uh, they, they set up two <coughs> setups and were able to actually create in the laboratory something that reproduced exactly what was on the other one uh, by making a phone call. And that has never been done. You know this is the cutting edge of research really uh, for for this kind of stuff. I also read. This month, again, and this month too is today, I think your hands on a good one. Uh, that people, that entanglement, direct entanglement demonstrations have been done on a scale of a meter now. So this is what we're talking about. Meters, kilometers, we're not talking about Mars, Jupiter, or anything like that. Uh, it's very difficult to keep, qu quantum states are very fragile. If they interact with the universe in any way, <laughs> then they're destroyed, or change, or make a choice. So you have to actually build something that's very isolated from everything else, or somehow make repeaters so that it can keep making itself over and over again. And those problems aren't solved. Those are big problems for quantum computing. Uh, it's also not entirely clear what the uh, class of problems that quantum computers are better than other computers for. There are some classes of problems that can be solved faster. On the other hand, it's fundamental physics. I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, you may argue about the applications. You know, applications that typically take years after you figure out what's going on, typically. I mean, it's, it's quite unusual to be the person involved in the application and also discovering it. That what happens. So it's not a fantasy. These are real experiments, and that's a real website. You can go look at the University of Innsbruck in Austria and read all about it, and you'll probably find a lot of jargon, which maybe force you back into the literature which may force you back into some books on the subject. But I hope that from this lecture, you've gotten enough of a feeling for the spirit of the thing that you can understand that the key is not, in fact, super mathematical complication at all, but rather understanding these uh, fundamental questions about how things go together and what can be a, and, and what is destroying what. So some conclusions. The great philosophical debates of the 30s, and they were great, all right, have become today's realities. I mean, we know this stuff for sure. There's lots of experiments. Uh, there's no real uh, 
there are still arguments about whether the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is right or some other kind. There's something called the many body, many worlds interpretation, which says that instead of making a choice, both things happen with the with the uh, so it, it, it you know both the x and the y go through, but two different universes are generated, which are then separated forever every time this happens. And this is happening a gazillion times a second, so there's a gazillion parallel universes being generated all the time. Every just speaking here, we're making billions of them all the second. It's kind of scary. Really. <laughs> you want to wake up so it's the same time. So that, but, but anyway, the great philosophical debates of the 30s, whether this stuff was really happening or not, have become today, today's realities. The first great, and this still probably the greatest triumph, was the periodic table. The understanding of why chemistry could exist and why it was periodic, all goes back to the understanding of the Bohr model and, uh, and things we didn't talk about, how many of those waves you could put together in, in different combinations. That is mathematical. That's a, if you have, it also explains the stickiness of atoms, their chemistry, which I think of as basically computing how sticky an atom is, whether they stick together or not. And all semiconductors, like computer chips and so on, the whole theory of semiconductors is based on quantum mechanics. Other applications include uh, almost all medical imaging that you do. If you get an MRI, you're making a quantum transition inside your body that is being picked up by, the, by radio equipment. Uh, same thing for PET scans, which are antimatter annihilation going on inside your body. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of stuff going on that is very science fiction in nature. And still to come, coming, classified, <laughs> that's all of it, is quantum cryptography, quantum <laughs> computing. And then I didn't talk about in this lecture for one second, hardly, particle physics. Just didn't mention it. I mean, the fact is physics is a wide, broad subject, and we do particle physics here, but quantum mechanics is much more basic than, uh, than particle physics. In fact, sometimes particle physicists aren't all that good at quantum mechanics, and we make mistakes. Uh, there, there are research mistakes made constantly by using classical reasoning instead of quantum reasoning, because it's very hard to get your mind around these ideas and use them consistently. You have to, of course, a certain discipline uh, consciously. So, and then I, I just finished with a quote from Feynman, where he was talking about the things we talked about and some of the paradoxes. Do you think it is not a paradox that is very peculiar, he said? On that we can all agree. It's what makes physics fascinating. Which I think quantum mechanics is probably, uh, to my mind, always been the thing that holds my interest the most, and I hope it's uh, been interesting to you as well, too. That's it, and then we just take some questions. Thinking of questions while the lecture's going on. Come on, jot them down. All right, there. <laughs> no, don't look behind you. Okay. Um, Anything, actually. I guess with the Alice and Bob thing, where it's the two things going the two ways going the opposite direction. What's so strange about the one being a Y and the one being no, there's nothing strange about it. The thing that's strange about it is that usually when we took a, a, a beam of, of light like that, we didn't know what direction it was coming a priori because we hadn't put any filters in there. If we put a filter in there, the intensity would go down. Half the time it would go through, half the time it wouldn't. Okay. Bob can set it up, if he knows what happened to Alice, he can set it up so it goes through 100% of the time. Okay. So in fact, uh, the, and, and that will happen in certain positions. Scans through, he can sort of figure out on a statistical basis uh, what everything is set to by how much, how much correlation he sees. But they have to talk to each other, so that's where the information. Do they really have to talk to each other. Yeah, they do. Because otherwise, you violate causality, and that, that, it's one thing it does not do is violate causality. It's a, it's a, it, it is a, it is non-local, but it does not violate causality. So special relativity still works. So the other lecturer that you heard, is, do you have half the in there already? Yeah. Yeah. Good, so that's what works. <laughs> but I have two ways to wake up screaming. I still don't understand why it's what's so strange about it. 
Well, you know, maybe it isn't strange. Maybe it's only strange if you come into it with the wrong mindset. I mean, I'll tell you what happened to me. Is when I started doing this stuff, I felt exactly as you do. I had to the start up, and I would say, well, I don't think it's that strange. It seems to me that this all adds up. It kind of makes sense. It kind of goes together. And, and I was really fine with it for until I got, you know, somewhat older. And then the older I got, the more it started bothering me. And now it bothers me. <laughs> so maybe maybe that's a maybe I'm the transition generation, you know, and that uh, it will never bother you. That may well be. And for the old guys that, that started off with doing classical physics, oh, I mean, they 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 <laughs> for the old guys that started off doing like Heisenberg, you know, they really had to scrunch their minds around into a funny place to be able to uh, to deal with this. But you may well be right. Maybe it won't bother you. I hope not. I actually do it all the time. Fiber really isn't relevant, right? You can use a cell phone just as well, or a uh, right. computer. Right. No, 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 no. No, that's a, that, that can be done in a different room, and it, he just gets the information, and then runs real quick over to the and sets it up so it's uh, before the uh, before the other half of the particle of the entangled pair can. So if he's far enough away, you know the entangled pair will be traveling. Say it's on. You get into problems about well, who's getting who's getting there first, or signals getting there first, and so on. And sometimes you have to delay things to make it work. But it's a uh, but no, it's not, it's not like that. the information is transmitted. So I got I got counter A and counter B all. Oh well, uh, the, the number of, you, you can already see. I think of the confusion that comes by having A B plus B A. So if you have A B C plus B A C plus C A B plus and so on, the co this, the combinatorics of the way the states go together gets very complicated, very rapidly, sort of factorially rapidly. So it becomes like uh, you, you know it goes up very fast. If you have a hundred particles, uh, they behave essentially like a practical because they, they're just too complicated. They're interacting and they're making all these resolutions of wave functions and things at once. Now there is an exception to that called the Bose-Einstein condensate, excuse me, in which the particles that have zero spin by a mathematical <coughs> trick they suddenly all fall into the identical state. And so you, then you have something that's essentially a giant macroscopic atom. It has all, that would be an interesting thing to, to quantum teleport, unfortunately. I don't know if that's been done. Yeah, that, that, but the, the, those, that's a macroscopic quantum study, so it's where they did, but it's a trick. It's a place where the mathematics has a, has a special solution. What, what wall is the loosely uh, understanding of quantum mechanics affect like the application of quantum mechanics? What won't it affect? What would it do, like the math, is it cosmology? It won't affect most stuff. It won't? No, it most stuff is classical. Understanding of well, most stuff is classical. I've been going through a big argument in my mind, for example, about whether evolution is a quantum process. Now, it used to be in the 50s that there was a, an enormous discussion about evolution being caused by cosmic rays. That the, the, the cosmic rays would come down and radiation would generate yeah. mutations, which they didn't know anything about yeah. to speak of. And that would cause you to, and you'll find this in old science fiction books, which I think that's the depressing amount of fun for you. He's saying, what will it not? Well, a lot, a huge amount, right? Well, you a huge amount, but not everything. Not everything. Otherwise, we'd never come up with an No, no, of course not. But I mean, he, he said, well, but the answer is things that, at, at a human scale, normally can be understood, or larger, normally can be understood by, by classical mechanics. It's, it's things at atomic or nuclear scales cannot. Things at macromolecular scales, like enzymes and uh, and so on, are right on the edge. 
and that's why evolution is an interesting problem. So what actually turns out that evolution is mostly driven by by uh, phase pair mismatching during DNA duplication, which happens very frequently, like one time in 10 to the 4. One in 10,000 makes a mistake, and then their correction mechanism, they go in and fix it, which is a darn good thing for your body. They push it down to a 1 in 10 to the 12 error rate. Uh, but th th that is not caused by radiation. It's just intrinsic to the copying process. And the question is, you know, how much, what that means is the wrong, the wrong nucleotide has come up to the, to the DNA, uh, to, the, to the enzyme that does the, the, the combination, the DNA polymerase. And the wrong enzyme has come up and somehow hooked in there and stayed long enough to, be, to, to form hydrogen bonds with the other thing. Most of the time it can. Most of the time it bounces off. It's the wrong one. Only the right one hits in the slot. So the question becomes how much quantum mechanics is involved in this question of how often it hits in the slot or not. I think it is. I believe that, in fact, the quantum mechanics, which determines chemistry, as we said before, can be interpreted as probabilities of things sticking together when they, when they hit each other. That's a, that's, a, that's a chemical reaction. So, in fact, I think at that level, quantum mechanics is making a, a decision about a, a random decision about what's happening. <laughs> but I'm not sure about that. Yeah, because it's at the boundary, you know. But those are those are meso scale problems. Okay, well thank you very much. You've been great. It's been a lot of fun.